Good morning. I am Frances Watson, an attorney, clinical professor of law at IU McKinney School of Law in Indianapolis. I direct a wrongful conviction clinic. I'm going to take just a few minutes at the beginning of this presentation to talk about the facts of the Daryl Pinkins and Roosevelt Glenn cases. These cases became part of my life for more than 15 years, and given those many years, I tend to view the case in timeline form. On the right in this picture is Daryl Pinkins, and on the left is Roosevelt Glenn. The picture was taken outside the jail on the day Mr. Pinkins was released, April 25, 2016. He was released after 25 years for a crime he did not commit. Mr. Glenn, his co-defendant, also convicted of the same crime, spent 16-plus years in prison for the crime he did not commit. Science has solved many cases, exonerated hundreds of people, and that's incredibly important. But we must always remember that there are human beings that are the faces of these exonerations. The third slide represents the timeline to the story. The story starts with DNA, and DNA, the double molecule, existed before it had a name, before it was recognized to exist by science. The crime happened in 1989, and many may recognize that that was the beginning of DNA use as a forensic tool in the courtroom, as a means of comparing individuals and proving guilt or innocence. This 1989 crime resulted in convictions and appeals, and the wrongful conviction clinic first became involved in 1999. The Wrongful Conviction Clinic recruited Dr. Greg Hempikian, a geneticist, to assist in 2004. And in turn, Dr. Hempikian recruited Dr. Mark Perlin and his cyber genetics products in 2014. 48 Hours, a CBS news show, got involved also in 2014. And I tend to say that 48 hours was the straw that broke the camel's back. On December 7, 1989, a woman in Lake County, Indiana, was attacked by five assailants, and she said, unequivocally, I can't identify any of them. But she also said that they all ejaculated. There had been a series of bumps, rapes, and robs, so the community was in a heightened state of fear. The police were eager to solve the crime. Eventually, five men were arrested. These men worked together. The three men, Pinkins, Glenn, and Durden, were friends. In fact, they happened to drive home on the night of December 7, 1989, in Durden's car. If you believe them, which I absolutely do, that car broke down and a pair of coveralls was taken from the car when the man walked away. That pair of coveralls eventually was left with the victim and then later traced to Luria Brothers, where Pinkins, Glenn, and Durden worked. It was this circumstantial evidence which led to the arrest of the five men. At the time of the initial arrests, there were no identifications. In fact, again, the victim said she could make no ID. Eight months later, a cell mark analysis is delivered, and that analysis has tested stains on items of clothing of the victim, a jacket and her sweater. And that report in 1990 indicated that all five men originally arrested, Durden, Pinkins, and Glenn, Jackson, and Daniels, all five men were excluded as having contributed to the DNA. In addition, the 1990 analysis identified at least two unknown banding patterns. As a result of this cell mark analysis, which excluded all five men as contributors, the state decided to dismiss Jackson and Daniels, and move forward against Durden, Pinkins, and Glenn on the theory that the crime was committed by Durden, Pinkins, and Glenn and two unknowns. It was Dr. Greg Hempikian who eventually made me understand that two unknowns might be more than two unknowns, that it wasn't just two unknowns, it was at least two unknowns. Slide 10 shows the conviction and appeal dates of Mr. Pinkins, He was found guilty in 1991, took his appeals. In 2001, there's actually additional DNA testing in a post-conviction action. And again, the 2001 DNA testing excluded all five men, including exclusions of Durden, Pinkins, and Glenn. This slide, slide 11, shows Mr. Glenn's timeline. His first jury, you will note, deadlocked, and eventually he was convicted of only one of three counts. 
Mr. Glenn's conviction was ultimately vacated on January 30, 2017. True Allele technology, in my opinion, was the basis for these convictions, the convictions of Mr. Pinkins and Mr. Glenn being vacated and the charges dismissed. We sought permission from the Indiana Court of Appeals to pursue a successor post-conviction action, and with that permission, we used the newly discovered evidence in the form of probabilistic genotyping of the DNA mixtures. Before we ever had a hearing, the state moved to dismiss the charges and vacate the convictions. This last picture is of Mr. Pinkins leaving jail that day in the arms of his co-defendant, Mr. Glenn. At this time, I have the opportunity to turn this talk over to Dr. Mark Perlin, who will give you insights into the science. Here is how Trulial found the five unknown genotypes. First, there was a jacket evidence item from the victim. Selmark did an STR analysis in 2001. They separated the jacket DNA into sperm and non-sperm fractions. The non-sperm fraction is labeled here as V for victim. For the sperm fraction, the lab was able to deduce a major component, about 90% of the DNA. Let's call this first genotype J for jacket. But they couldn't do anything with the minor component using conventional manual mixture interpretation. True allele can compare genotypes to calculate DNA match statistics. The results are shown in this match table. The table will grow during the presentation. The genotype rows will increase from one item of evidence to five items. The genotype columns will list more items for comparison. Here we compare the jacket evidence row with the reference columns shown for the victim and for Darrell Pinkins. The table entry numbers give the number of zeros in the match statistic. Nine zeros after the one make a billion, which is inclusionary. Eighteen zeros is a billion billion, even more support for a DNA association. Negative 18 is one over a billion billion, which is exclusionary, as seen here. So the major contributor to the jacket sperm sample did not match Pinkins, which was already known. For the sweater evidence, Selmark again separated sperm from epithelial cells, finding a major 80 or 90 percent contributor. Let's call the second major genotype S for sweater. Nothing was done at the time with the minor contributor since the lab was limited by conventional mixture interpretation. The expanded true allele match table shows match statistics for more genotype comparisons. The first row was for the jacket evidence, while the second row now adds the sweater evidence. The sweater DNA does not match the victim. Looking down the second reference column, labeled P for Pinkins, we see a negative 15 in red. That match statistic gives an exclusionary power of 1 over a quadrillion. So True Allele tells us that Darrell Pinkins is not on the sweater, nor was his DNA on the jacket. Another piece of evidence was hair left at the crime scene. We'll call it H for hair. Professor Watson discovered this evidence in her Roosevelt Glenn case. The hair was single-source DNA, giving a clear third genotype. The third row, H, represents the hair genotype. The match table compares the row's hair evidence with column references for the victim, Pinkins, and Glenn. Again, we see that there is no match. Negative 18, shown in red, is exclusionary at a level of one in a billion billion. The second column shows no match between any of the three evidence items and Darrell Pinkins. The third column, for Roosevelt Glenn, also shows no match to crime scene DNA evidence. The major genotypes for these three evidence items were similar. Trulial statistically compared these evidence genotypes to each other, quantifying their similarity. 
most crime labs cannot calculate evidence-to-evidence -evidence match statistics. We asked the question, how similar are these genotypes to each other? And the match statistics, highlighted in green, told us there was a positive association between the different genotypes. For example, the four zeros shown in the top right green entry, 4.15, means 10,000. Why is that? Why would the DNA found on the jacket, sweater, and hair be similar? Why would three different perpetrators show positive match values? The three genotypes are indeed quite similar. The figure shows alleles at each locus. Typically, genotypes have different alleles, but here we see many shared alleles. For example, let's look at the locus D5 genotypes in the third row. We see the three evidence genotypes, each drawn in a different color, red, green, or blue. Yet out of a dozen allele possibilities, only one allele is present, allele 13. The genotypes all have the identical 13-13 homozygous allele pair. What a coincidence! The next row shows the locus D7 genotypes, but the allele pairs are identical for the three genotypes. They all have the same 10-11 heterozygous allele pair. The other genetic loci also show considerable allele sharing. Why are these three evidence genotypes so similar to each other? We had True Allele conduct a kinship analysis. Starting with one person's genotype, shown in blue, the computer inferred a sibling genotype, shown in red. The relative's genotype is probabilistic, which is typical in genetics. True Allele compared these siblings, shown in the rows, with the original evidence shown in the columns. Here we see positive genotype associations, shown in green, having three, four, and five zeros. Those numbers correspond to match statistics in the thousands, tens of thousands, and hundreds of thousands. This is precisely the association level seen with siblings. Moreover, the individuals were all male, since they had an XY genotype at the amelogenin gender locus. So these three perpetrators are brothers. The computer found three related assailants. This table compares three evidence rows to six genotype columns. The left three columns are for references. The right three columns are the evidence genotypes. Why? Because using match statistics, we want to see whether the evidence genotypes are different from each other. So far they are, since we've explained the positive associations, shown in green, through kinship. Continuing, True Allele then found a fourth genotype from the jacket. This is a 10% minor contributor. True Allele ran a joint analysis of the two jacket samples. Shown here, on the top row, is STR data from the third jacket PCR amplification. Data from the fourth jacket amplification is shown on the bottom row. The computer can examine all of this data together, something that people cannot do. The result is a fourth inferred evidence genotype called JJ for jacket jacket. The fourth row of the match table represents the JJ genotype. Comparing this minor jacket genotype with the genotype columns, we see negative match statistics across the bottom row. The jacket jacket genotype does not match the victim. Comparison with Mr. Pinkins is negative 8.5 or 1 in a billion. The JJ genotype does not match Mr. Glenn. And importantly, this fourth evidence genotype does not match the other evidence. Those negative values are exclusions. True Allele found a fourth new and different genotype. A fifth evidence genotype arises from the jacket and the sweater. 
True Allele jointly analyzed their DNA data together. This new genotype is a 5% minor contributor to the evidence. We'll call it JS for the jacket and sweater items it came from. The figure shows a probabilistic genotype at locus D5. The horizontal axis lists different allele pair possibilities, while the vertical axis and bars show allele pair probability. In dark blue is the fourth JJ genotype, the minor jacket jacket. In lighter blue is the fifth JS genotype from the jacket and sweater. We see that genotypes JJ and JS have different probability patterns. They are different genotypes. True allele has produced a fifth evidence genotype. Looking at the match table, we see that the new bottom row for JS has negative statistics. The new fifth evidence genotype does not match the victim or Darrell Pinkins or Roosevelt Klen. The jacket sweater minor genotype does not match the other evidence genotypes. It is different from the jacket, sweater, hair, and jacket jacket evidence genotypes. This lack of statistical association means that Truallele found five different evidence genotypes. How did we get all these DNA results? We used Truallele computer methods that went far beyond conventional Innocence Project mixture interpretation. First, we statistically compared evidence with evidence. Simpler methods can't make those mixture comparisons. Second, we calculated exclusionary match statistics. Older methods, like CPI, can only include, but cannot exclude. Third, we revealed a 5% minor contributor. It is essential in some DNA exonerations to extract minor contributors from the data. Fourth, we analyzed DNA mixture data from multiple items with joint Bayesian analysis. Simple software cannot do this. Fifth, we showed that three of the perpetrators were brothers. Since none of the accused were brothers, the prosecution's case fell apart. We found five unidentified genotypes and proved that the defendants were not linked to crime scene DNA. We used true allele computing to unmix the mixtures and transcend human limits in forensic interpretation. Moving forward, what can you do? Computer reanalysis of old DNA data helped establish Pinkins and Glenn's innocence. How? The exculpatory DNA evidence was available 15 years ago. Old 20th century human review could not extract all the information. It did not find all five genotypes. New 21st century computer analysis overcame those artificial limitations. Truallele could establish five different people who were not the defendants. Failed DNA interpretation cost Mr. Pinkins 15 years of his life in an Indiana prison. It is unacceptable to use old failed methods that keep innocent people in jail. There are thousands of cases with misinterpreted or inconclusive DNA. Other innocent people are wrongfully imprisoned because of flawed mixture interpretation. Crime labs have the data, but no one has interpreted this data using the best science. We must revisit these old cases. Inconclusive results mean look at the data again with better methods. Limited methods do not give definitive answers. Re-examining old forensic data can discover new exculpatory evidence. That is what Truallele found in the Pinkins exoneration. One lesson is that you need to seek pro bono DNA help. One, if you're in Indiana, call Professor Watson. Two, elsewhere, you can contact Professor Greg Hampikian. He has a Bloodsworth grant to analyze DNA evidence for pro bono 
Truilliel exoneration in three other states. Three, for cases in the other 46 states, contact me. We do a lot of pro bono work. We recently formed a nonprofit entity for legal education and public service, helping to ensure that no DNA is left behind. There is more information online about Truilliel, describing how the technology has been validated, accepted, proven reliable, and widely used. Thank you.